Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Good Times Hour. Uh, I got a couple of quick announcements to make. We are moving right into the 2024 year with uh, technology. We're going to be we're going to be populated on Spotify and on Apple Music this week. And our next show is going to be in a little bit of a different format. It won't really change the way that you see us because we'll be on Facebook Live and we'll be on we'll also be on YouTube Live, which is new. And um, we can also email out links and then we'll be posted on Spotify and Apple Music going forward and we'll add to a few other places. All right. Without further ado, take it away, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world, please welcome to the tea our next special guest. It all started in Florence, where he launched the platter at light poles and the fence and anything that mattered. But in the move to Colombia from Old Flow, he acquired a super pro and a gang of neighborhood kids who loved to throw the big lids. However, it was in the Queen City when he got, his, he got to the nitty gritty of becoming a pro and putting the sport on public show, weaving a dream while believing in the gleam which comes from the beveled edge. He tried with the Tigers in their orange and regalia, and now he's fully stocked in the colors of the Gamecocks, pushing disc golf into academia. He's an icon and a name, and part of his fame is his game that goes on and on. For 40 years, he's been proudly repping the sport as promoter and a player, hushing the naysayers and doubters, throwing in of a straight and true and looking fine in champion blue. 43 seasons on the PDGA database and over 700 events means an incredible amount of reasons to admire this gent. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. Joining us from lovely Chapin, South Carolina, He's the OGNC Mac Daddy and the certified thousand rated caddy. He's the dream weaver and perennial disc ball fever. He's Alan Beaver. Welcome to the show. You're welcome, Alan. Thanks, Paul. That's great. Glad uh, to be here. Great to have you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Al. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. We're going to jump right in here to the framework. Um, your PDJ number is 1213, which is a kind of a cool sequence. And um, where do you remember what prompted you to get that? Was it for one specific event or did you just do it because you thought this, I'm going to be playing events. This is the thing to do. What's the story behind your PDJ number? Well, I was in Charlotte and um, uh, playing for two or three years. And then we found out there was going to be a professional event at Myrtle beach. So uh, in April, Almost uh, 44 years ago this month, I uh, went ahead and submitted, uh, you know, mailed in my application. Uh, the, the tournament was in Myrtle Beach, uh, you know, like in September. So I got my, my official member number in April and played my first tournament in September. Was that, what, what, do you remember what year that was? 1980. 1980. Wow. Okay, cool. Nice. Right on. So uh, you were inducted into the World Disc Golf Hall of Fame in 2002 with Gary Lewis, and you are in the inaugural class for the North Carolina Disc Golf Hall of Fame, which was just announced with uh, your old buddy, was it, well, with your all your old buddies, Carlton, Howard, Harold Duvall, Stan McDaniels, and Steve Lambert. Um, man, that's just some pretty good company in both cases. When is that yes, ceremony? When are you going to be inducted? Um, Robert Leonard was gracious enough to head that up, and uh, there was a committee together. They haven't decided uh, exactly when it's going to be. Uh, still not yet, but it's out, and I look forward to it. That's that's a pretty amazing class that you're a member of there, in either case, for sure. So 2011, you won the Senior Player of the Year, the Jim Olson Senior Award, and you're in the Century Club, which I can't imagine there's too many people that are in the 100 wins. Well, I mean, I'm sure there's several, but I I can't imagine how many. So you got 100 wins, you're closing in on 200, and you're this one's really cool. Two-time winner of the Tim Selinski U.S. Masters in 2013 and 2015. Uh, that, um, go all, great, all great accomplishments. Uh, the uh, Tim Solanskis were both in North Carolina. Uh, some of the the events, the divisions were smaller, but uh, I was there and um, 
Tim was a great friend, and it's an honor to 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 win his events. Is that am I mistaken? But isn't that a Slinsky Trophy over your right shoulder there? Uh, yes, it's a Mace Man glass, very nice looking trophy that's on display. <clears throat> wow, that's awesome! Look at that. Sorry, I yeah. didn't put it out front. That's all right, man. It's the fact that you got it on display. And and for me, that was really cool too, because that was the probably the sec well, the second big event that I ever did besides USTGC. And like you got one, Stan McDaniel got one, Elaine King got one, uh, Barry Schultz got one. And and so that means a lot to me too, that you know, some of my friends have my trophies yeah. at their house. That's that's permanent display there. That's not just for show tonight. Uh, it stays there. I, we're we're in my office, although I've been retired for you know twelve years, uh, except when I went back to work teaching a class. But you know, uh, I've got you know some trophies and things over nice. there. But, but that yeah. one's uh, wow. that one's on display, uh, permanent display there. Are those baseballs or golf balls in that rack? Uh, those are golf balls. Uh, okay. You got all the bowling ones? There's a few baseballs over there, too. Wow. Nice. Nice. Yeah, that up. Uh, uh, so, Stat Mando says you've played 711 events, and you've got 660 top 10 finishes, 557 caches, 451 podiums, and 186 wins. That's uh, all of those numbers are impressive. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't really track uh, those things. Uh, I, I do keep track of, of some items, but uh, I will let the PDGA and now Stat Mando, uh, I stand by what they say. <laughs> well, this, uh, I tell you this is, I think, a really good time, although it's probably coming up later, but um, one of the things that I think is pretty remarkable that I didn't know about you until we started talking and and until Paul did some research as well, but uh, you track you've tracked in one form or fashion all the rounds you've played, and you're you just passed sixty five hundred rounds lifetime, and I would imagine like I even thought at first I was like wow that surely there's more, but then I started thinking about six thousand five hundred rounds of golf. That's a lot of golf. That's a lot of exercise. That's that's really impressive. I I couldn't tell you how many I've played, but I know it isn't. It's probably not even half that. Yeah, you can play around with the math, you know, and say, well, I played every, I played once a week, you know, for the last twenty years, and twenty times three sixty five, and see what that is. But yeah, I started that a long time ago. Uh, Carl Howard and I kind of started. Of tracking that I actually track practice rounds and tournament rounds but both those combined just past 6500 uh, you know now the players can UDISC and other apps can track that so that's a good start uh, but uh, of course we started way back before then uh, you know I've got hundreds of these little uh, at a glance monthly calendar nice and, and and the thing to do is you keep it in your car and you finish the round and you're driving back or at least keep it close by and just tag you know put that in there uh i don't do anything with it other than just track it but uh that's how you keep up with it from month month to month and it, well, me, and it adds up <laughs> let me just share this this is an example of uh, with 2024, you played Seneca Gold, and then April 2021, I'm not sure where this was, but there's some of your tracking right there. This is some great well, stats action. Actually, actually, that's my caddy, uh, that's my caddy scorecard notes. Now, I keep the rounds. You know, all I did with all that, that information, only thing that would go in there is those final totals. You know, and Seneca, then I know for that weekend, I had four tournament rounds. But something Seneca that. Creek? Is that Seneca Creek in Maryland? 
No, no, I've never been there. That's uh, Seneca, South Carolina, up near Clemson. Uh, okay. It was an A tier, and uh, and you see the twenty one card there. And uh, it was the last time I played before this year. So those are notes at the bottom. You know, T A M. Those are just disc. You know, turn, mamba, oh, ABR. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. All and, right. And 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 sometimes I'll look back and say like, well, I really messed up on hole seven, so I need to bear down and really think about it when I get to hole seven this year. But so what's the what does the R mean on hole seven there? You have the AVR first, but then the R would what, what yeah. The R uh, that's good point. Uh, that's uh that's an understable rock. rock you know, uh, uh, I may have switched from an AVR to a understable rock the little dot there indicates uh, stability but uh, okay. you know in golf they every week they get you know a, a book and it gives them all the yardages and and in in the golf pros they know exactly how far to hit clubs based on whatever the distance is uh back in the day i would step things off and put markers down now we have you know, range finders, and we can make it a lot easier. But uh, uh, that just gives me some support. You know, I can look at that and say, yeah, that, that'll that work. Look at that. That's part of the meticulous attention to detail and preparation that, <laughs> that you're legendary for. So let's just jump right into your origin story. I know <clears throat> I kind of mentioned this at the beginning in your intro. Um you have, uh, in your conversation with, with Brian earlier, you talked about growing up in Florence and your first experience, your first your first reconnoiter with the Frisbee world was with the actual Pluto platter. Before Whammo got the rebrand, you actually got a, your hands on a Pluto platter. First of all, that must have been pretty rare at the time, was it not? Like there weren't, every household had a Pluto platter, did they? It was, and I can, I'd can. i love to tell the story because it's a family thing. Uh, well, Florence, South Carolina is about, you know, an hour and a half from here, up by 20. Uh, and I uh, lived there just, just for a few years, uh, moved from North Carolina to South Carolina. Uh, my uncle was in the Merchant Marines, so he traveled the world. He'd be gone eight months out of the year and home for three and that's where I learned the concept of golf because my uncles and dad would go out and play golf. We'd just play, you know, we'd just hang out, play in the creek or go look for golf balls. We didn't really play, but but they were out there. But I don't know how I was the lucky one for him to give me the disc, but uh, because I had, you know, cousins, uh, his sons and daughters, but maybe they were already playing golf and he knew I played baseball. So that's where I got my first, you know, uh, you know, Pluto platter disc, you know, lightweight. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't do much with it at first, but I went to Myrtle beach. It's only an hour away from Florence. This is goes full circle. You know, I go to the beach and I see people playing Frisbee. Nice. So this 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 was like 1965, 66. I know the grade I was in and I know when I moved so I can easily equate that to, to where it was. But when I saw him playing, I didn't take my Frisbee to the beach, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but when I saw that, I said, hey, I got one of those. And so I ah. just got back, started playing, playing catch, and then created, you know, object course on the street I lived on. So that that's a that's actually a good point. We've talked to a bunch of people and the there there's kind of a, a, a divide. When people have their, their first experience with Frisbee, usually it's with the play and track and catch or trick catch or trick throw kind of variety. But for some people, because they didn't, you know, maybe Carlton didn't have a lot of friends growing up he actually invented the game or for himself a target shooting kind of game like like frisbee golf for you it was both trick catch and frisbee golf was that what it was i gotta say almost immediately and i remember playing like uh, what's now mta you know those things are so light you could just throw them up in the air and they would float around uh, i i 
I know one time I was chasing one and, and fell down and just got all muddy, you know, because it wafted back and I tried to turn around to catch it and just my feet went out from under me and I was sliding backwards. So I was playing MTA too. That's awesome. Nice. Nice. So, okay. So you Frisbee obviously grabbed a hold of you early and you also played your own kind of rudimental rudimentary beginning of disc golf, Frisbee golf before. So we look at the PDJ database and, and officially the first events logged for you are in 1982, but Frisbee was in the zeitgeist before that. And there were Frisbee meets and events and fly-ins and all that kind of stuff. Did you play in an event before that officially? Like, what was your first kind of introduction to competitive Frisbee? Oh, yeah, we played um, in the late 70s. You know, uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, had the first basket course that went in. Uh, it, it wasn't in until the 80s, but but in Raleigh, Carl, in the, in, the, in the rattle crew, they were holding events. Tom Monroe, my mentor, was in Charlotte before uh, I met with some of his uh, friends that were there running the fly-ins. I was I was upset that they were telling me about a Frisbee fly-in that was up at the lake, and I just didn't know anything about it, you know, or I would have been there. But right. so we started playing tournaments in the late 70s. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's just jump into North Carolina disc golf history, Mace. Right on. So uh, the birth of disc golf in North Carolina began with Tom Monroe, as did so many other states in the, in the Southeast and South Southern areas and the Eastern East coast over there. Um, were there other Frisbee meets and events and tournaments happening before the arrival of Tom? I mean, there was several things before he got there, wasn't there? I've given him all the credit. Uh, the, the, the first people I met in Charlotte already knew Tom. The first, oh, right on. The first course in in Charlotte uh, was, other than maybe the course, you know, that the neighbor's hood made like Steve Lambert had on his, where he lived, uh, the first course where the public could go play was at UNCC. It was an object course. But I met, uh, you know, Dennis Burns, Leslie Presnell, Porter, people that were there that I still look up to, especially Leslie uh, Presnell Porter. They were at UNCC, and I literally read in the paper on Sunday morning that there was a uh, you know, the North Carolina Frisbee Disc Championships was going on at UNCC. And I said, what? I went over there that 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 same day. And it was just a small group finishing up playing disc golf, you know, like only like five people. But that's how I met those folks. And shortly after working with the Parks Department, as I'd been for the last five or six years, they said, hey, maybe you can take us to some parks and we can find a, a, a place to put a course in the park. No problem. <laughs> okay, so before we get any further, I just want to show, this is the Lambert Trophy. This is the North Carolina Disc Golf Champions. And if we look in closely here, 1977 is when it starts. And the first two names are Tom and Rowe. Alan Beaver, you appear in 1982, which is great amazing and that's when your pdga career kind of starts at least according to the pdga database but for early north carolina history we just have to look to common realm well yeah it's, i was gonna say four out of the first five were won by tom monroe and then uh beave gets two in a row and then carl gets two in a row and then johnny sias gets two in a row and then carl allen carl man you guys were trading it off yeah, that's a, that's a well, great trophy, by the way. Look at that. That that's is a great trophy. This is a perfect example of Steve Lambert's work. Yes, it is. It's a, it's an awesome trophy. What what we ended up doing uh, when Steve created that, I think I I was the first person to actually be able to to hold that trophy and keep it for the year. The winner gets to keep the trophy for a year. 
it's, wow. it's in Raleigh right now. Uh, Gabe Styles out of Raleigh won that through a point series. We started out, uh, Tom, and, and I don't remember those 70s, 78s, but Steve did the research, went back and looked at the records and awarded those those winners, Tom, that those those uh, plate. You know, he went ahead and, and went back and put those and it started in, you know, in 77. Wow. So then uh, he did the history on that. And then I created the, the North Carolina Disc Golf Champion Series. We could put together a points, you know, based on the number of tournaments you play and where you finish. And then that, then we went into the, to the points system to award that to the winner. Wow, that's really cool. I got to see that trophy a couple of times in person, and I'm sure that it was awesome to, to, to keep it at your house for, for, you know, a few years. Without yeah. a doubt. Very special. So um, how long, when did you go to work for Mecklenburg County? Parks and Rec. Uh, September of 76. Uh, wow. I graduated from Clemson in, in uh, December of 1979, 75. And uh it was not actually Mecklenburg County. It was uh, Charlotte Park and Rec Commission. Then it went to the city of Charlotte. And then in the 19, uh, around 2000, 1995, they, the city and the county merged. And it went from the city uh, Park and Rec to Mecklenburg County Park and Rec. Okay. It was one of the, one of the interesting things is that when we talked to Carlton, he was talking about the push to get disc golf courses in Raleigh. And this was after Tom Monroe had already put New Horizons Park into Winston-Salem. And they first approached, you know, city officials and they basically the city officials just rebuffed them and said, you know, you, you guys are just college graduates. What do you, what do you count? What do you matter for? Well, they went, they went back, they got jobs, they bought the houses, they started paying property taxes. They came back to the, the relevant officials and said, now we're taxpayers. We want to say in how, you know, tax. We're not temporary residents anymore. Yeah. So, but for you, you were already in Mecklenburg County or at least the city of Charlotte parks department before. I mean, you already already had disc golf fever, but in 76, this is, this is early dawn of the year, era. And so, you are primed in the position to be the person that everyone wants to be to be able to get this golf going. How did that, did you know at the time, like, Hey, I'm the, I'm the gatekeeper here. No, not initially. You know, uh, when I started my job, uh, I had my coworkers, there were several that were uh, golfers. And so I was playing, you know, golf. Uh, but not a lot, you know, uh, I can break a hundred, but I don't play that often. Uh, okay. Even back then, uh, it wasn't until uh, I read that article in the paper that the North Carolina champions, you know, just, uh, well, Frisbee golf, no, it was Frisbee, North Carolina uh, Frisbee championships because they had other events. I didn't see those. They were on Saturday. I just caught the tail end of golf on Sunday. Okay. That's where I met those people like in 78, 79. And then uh, Steve Lambert, a very good close friend. Uh, he was playing on, on disc golf on his street. Uh, I met him a short time later uh, through the, the, the Tom Monroe events. And, and he, He's as instrumental as getting things going. Our first course with some what uh, temporary targets. He he donated the first basket in Latta Park, which went on to be our first public disc golf course. Wow. Okay, so before we talk about <clears throat> disc golf specifically in the beveled edge and all that, let's let's take it back to those that era of the overall events, the flying disc sports. And I know the PDJ database is really incredible, really is, and I've really relied on it a lot. But it only tracks 
the disc golf side of things. And so when you have these overall events, so when you look at the PDGA database, your first two events are one is a qualifying event for the World Frisbee Championships, and the second one is the 82 World Frisbee Championships. Um, did you compete? Did you actually play all of the overall events when you oh, would yeah. enter these tournaments? Okay. Uh, I I did them all. My, my disc golf partner, he made me freestyle. So I, so uh, he would play disc golf with me. Okay. <laughs> I got you. So he was the freestyler. You were the disc golfer and you switched, you swapped over just to like make the other happy. That's right. Uh, okay. But we will again play disc golf. But again, Tom comes to town. He, he puts together the, the overall events, you know, at UNCC held several big overall events, uh, freestyle, uh, distance, the North North American series. We were involved with that. Right. Uh, that was one of the events there. So we were we were doing all that. And then Raleigh again, we'd go to Raleigh to and there were overall events. I I can't even do this today with disc golf, but uh, I threw, uh, it was uh, one of those Olympic whammo, 100 mold, you know, what, 130 gram. I threw that thing 100 yards in competition. <laughs> wow. I can, I can barely do that now with a disc golf disc. <laughs> That's a, that's a good hug for 300 feet. You know, I mean, I, I have to admit, I bought three Frisbees earlier this year when I was out in Phoenix because I, of all the people that we've been interviewing and I just, there, we watched a couple of videos, one of them was Captain Snap and all three of us, it was a set a video from 76 and Paul in Toronto, Snap in Hawaii, myself in Arlington, we were like going, look at the flight on that disc. And I was like, you know what? I need to start playing catch again. I just need to, I need to get out and see some of that stuff again and just slow it down a little bit. And, and um, yeah, it's just that, man, I, I, I've got them out a couple of times and I'm not, I'm probably not even at 250. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not 200. Well, when you, when you look at, I was just going through it again and looking at Tammy Pelican and she was the first woman in North America to crack a hundred meters with a, with a big lid. And that's that's 330 feet. I there's no way I can. Yeah. So let me just take you back to 1982, the World Frisbee Championships. You'd played the qualifying tournament, and it's the first time it's in Rutgers. Usually it was in for all the years before it was in Irvine <clears throat> or in SoCal, and now we're on the campus of Rutgers. Oh, oh, look at that! He's got 1982. Look at it. it looks perfectly now, Tron. Check this out. Oh wow. My goodness. There's Scott Zimmerman. There's Snapper. Wow. Look at these names. That's nice, dude. Yeah. So that was your was was that your first World Frisbee Championship? Oh yeah. And, and what did you think? I was I was just tagging along with Tom. He was gracious enough to I, I rode in the a Frisbee South van. We started out at, in uh, <clears throat> Knoxville at the World's Fair. We met there. I drove from Charlotte. He met. He went from Huntsville. We stayed with uh, Grant Posey there, went to the World's Fair, got up the next day and drove like 10 hours to his parents' house in New Jersey and spent the night and then went to Rutgers the next day. We stayed in a dorm. Like like at the at the championships, the disc golf championships there in Toronto, uh, okay. all week, and wow. it was just uh, all day action. It, it was, I was, you know, I was blown away. You know, my bet, you know, discathon. Who 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 even knows what discathon is? You know? Right. Uh, you know, that was my best finish. Uh, I don't wow. remember where I finished in golf. I wasn't going to freestyle. I knew enough that I, I knew I wasn't good enough to compete with those top players. But there was two two German guys, uh, Hartmut Workman, or uh, right. 
he he and his partner they needed a third person for to do their routine so so uh, i stepped in it was it was scary but but i pulled it off <laughs> that's incredible that's so we just as a digression we've talked to uh tita and uh i can't remember who it was else but from that 82 worlds there was a Hartmut story where he had thrown into the pond and then, you know, he climbed in. The, he, he didn't want to Everybody sacrifice knows story, again. Knows story. <laughs> so <laughs> do, do you remember that on the uh, during the course? Were I you, sure were, do. Were you in his foursome? No, no, I wasn't in his foursome. Uh, I don't want to say I saw it live, but I, 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 I saw something. <laughs> you can't unsee it, right? <laughs> So just just to, to finish off before we get into your disc golf career, um, obviously you didn't. Some some players they they look to and they they really gravitated towards all the other field events and they were very good at it. And you know one of I could just one of the pieces of people that come to mind is Captain Snap that that we interviewed earlier, and he was very big into the the MTA and other types of field events. Um, so you haven't, in your career, at least from Statman or PJ, we can't see that you played a lot of those overall events. However, we have two on the record. 86, you played the Virginia States, which is approaching its 50th anniversary or already has. And in 2019, you played the WIFDIF Championships in Richmond. Uh, so obviously, you've kind of kept up with it. Is there anything, I mean, if disc golf is the number one in your life, in terms of overall, what's what's kind of a secret number two? As far as the disc disc sports, yeah, I'd have to say uh, self golf, like okay. uh, more so the MTA. Uh, uh, I, I I did play them. Uh, in, you know, you, you may know that I was teaching a flying disc sports class at, at USC, yeah. so. Uh, that's a rarity that someone can come in and teach the dis different disciplines. We did not do freestyle because it was just too difficult. You know, I could take it and spin it on my finger or do a body roll, you know, every now and then. But, uh, you know, in college, the, I call it the big U. Number one is ultimate. But uh, but disc golf, is, disc golf is here now in college. Mm. If you just look at the last week's event in Rock Hill with the coll collegiate disc golf. But yeah, uh, I was teaching the class and we were in the gym and out on the uh, uh, intramural field. And uh, so I was, we were doing accuracy, DDC, uh, you know, uh, distance, you know, three weeks of ultimate, three weeks of disc golf. Wow. Well, we'll 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 get more into that, but first let's let's start with your disc golf career as a player. Right on. So um, the most recent tournaments you've been playing lately are North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia. But one of the things that Paul, now I know that I looked on your courses that you played, but Paul didn't find any results that you'd played any tournaments in California. But is that the case? I mean, I saw Santa Cruz on there, and I saw a couple other, a uh, couple other courses that you played. Did you not play any tournaments in California? I don't think so. Uh, I, I can't think of any tournaments I've played there. I've, I've played the courses in San Francisco, San Diego, uh, Santa Cruz, but uh, no officially being. Larry Leonard used to try to get me to go out to play. You know the the Tim Selinski when it was in uh, La Mirada. You know he he tried for years to get me to do that. I, I never did, and I regret that. But I don't think so. Wow, okay. interesting. Well, but you know that's one of the things Paul and I talked about this because he brought it up brought it up to me earlier in the week, and I think that that's partially because I mean honestly, you didn't really necessarily have to leave ever where you were at i mean it was probably small groups in the very beginning but it probably didn't take long before there was good sized groups every time you showed up for a tournament am i correct in that assumption 
Yeah, er, early on, uh, you know, when I was playing in the Open, there was more players, maybe not so many now. But, uh, uh, well, you know, we still look forward to going to the World Championships, wherever that was. Right. You know, my, one, my one chance to play in, 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 in California, I did not go to the uh, – to the uh, championships, uh, was it in? Where was it? Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Yeah. yeah, Santa yeah. Cruz. I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't go to there. I mean, you did go to the West Coast. You played the Oregon Worlds in Portland, which was at least you got some representation there. But California's that's in terms of disc golf, that's or frisbee sports. That's the the birthplace of it all, really. So. Oh yeah. And considering you were such an amazing and, and long lasting icon in the disc golf world, it seems like uh, the next trip you book should be California. That's what I'm just saying. Maybe <laughs> I can still make it. I think you got a year or two in you. So uh, your first event, the first tournament you played, was that in Myrtle Beach? And Carl was a spectator? That was considered the first pro event, DGA, uh, PDGA wasn't officially a, an organization yet. Uh, so uh, Tom was there, uh, you know, big names, Scott Zimmerman, Snapper was there, LeVon Wolf was there. Wow. This was in Myrtle Beach. This was in uh, 1980. Wow. Okay, so uh, there was – you know, big hitters that, that that came because they knew that there was a a money event. Was it true that that Carl was just on the on the the spectating sidelines, thinking he wasn't well, good enough to play? He told me that, and I didn't realize it or really. I, we had probably knew each other already, but we didn't run into each other. Uh, but I, I'm. I believe that's what he said. He was there, but he didn't play. So we're going to, um, I mean, since Carl was just on like two weeks ago and I talked to him, I don't talk to him as much as you do, I don't think, but then you never know. But um, we want to start doing this and we're going to do this going forward. And I said, I hit him up yesterday and I said, Hey, I need a, I need a, I need an Al Beaver story. And um, he said, Oh, I got a couple. And I said, listen, you got to make sure he's going to want to talk about it. And he goes, oh, here we go. So he told me that one time you were playing. Let me look at this because he sent me this as a text. And this is pretty funny. He said, uh, and you mentioned the course already. He said that one time you guys were playing at Latta Park. This was in 1984. And he said that you kicked your bag and you were at the top of the ravine. And there was a substantial creek at the bottom, and all of your discs rolled over 100 feet into the creek. Is there any truth to that? Latta Park. The, uh, I don't recall the Latta Park one. I, I won't deny it, but uh, I think it's on record that I hold a record for the longest bag kick. But that was up in Laurel Springs in the mountains. There was oh, no yeah. There was no creek for the disc to go in, but uh, the disc came out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> right on. All so, right, so you so, got one on Carl. Do you want to tell a, a dirty story on Carl while we're at it? Do you want to come back? No, to that? I got a I got a funny story. Uh, it was like uh, 1984, same time we I met him and went to. Uh, uh, Maryland to play in the uh, Cherry Blossom Open it was a 99-hole tournament. Dave Griffin was the TD there. Uh, it, was, it was a big event, but you know, 99 holes. I, I won that. I won it, you know. And all he did was complain about how many spit-outs he had during the tournament after we left, you know. And he was just complaining. We had a great weekend staying with Dave Griffin, but on the ride back home, he was driving. He had like a he had a like an orange Firebird. I think he was driving that, and I'm just a passenger. So he complained about all those spit outs. We get to a toll booth. We don't have toll booths around North Carolina or South Carolina. Gets to a toll booth. 
throws the money in, and damn if it don't bounce out. <laughs> that's hard to do. That's I've had that to happen do. to me at the airport before when I was running late to pick somebody up, and that's like you're already running late, and then that the change just goes everywhere, and you're like, I don't have any more. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Right. So, what about rivalries? You got? Is there? I mean, you've been playing forever. You, you, uh, you've got to have some rivalries over there and in, in and amongst those Carolina boys. Yeah, uh, it changes over time. You, you hate to uh, lose some of your friends that move on or don't play anymore. Uh, right. One, one of my rivalries that just uh, I was talking to someone earlier today, texted him about, was Jerry Harmon uh, out of Tennessee. Right. Um, Great competitor. He would come to North Carolina, South Carolina. We'd come to South Carolina and play in the South Carolina Disc Golf Championship. Wasn't that far from Tennessee for him, but we would play together. And then we played against each other in big events, uh, the Charlotte Worlds. And uh, we started calling each other the enemy because <laughs> we were battling. But in Tennessee, it's called enemy. So we would call it, I would just say enemy. So I one of the one of the things that, that came out for me in the research was the North Carolina or sorry, the, the cross state doubles that would happen between Tennessee and, and North Carolina. Did you participate in any of those? Uh, I, I'm, I'm remiss to say I never did. Right. Uh, it started out in Burlington which was a couple hours from Charlotte. And, and then they would go over to into uh, Kingsport, I think, is where they were playing. Right. So uh, I've never been a real big doubles person, uh, but I enjoy it, but, but I, I never did. All right. That's uh, interesting stuff. Because that's a longstanding thing that's really united the, the two states together, especially, you know, the Cross Smoky Mountains divide there that's yep. inculcating some great disbelief communities there so your first well your first north carolina tournament was in at, uh the first horizons park classic in winston-salem and you took second out of 24 eight strokes behind johnny size mm -hmm. but then your first win came the next year oh no that same year uh halloween two golf uh, October 29th and 30th in 1983, and you won by eight over Carl. So those were, that's still, that's still Frisbee style, not, not disc golf style, like beveled edge discs, right? 1983. Right. Ladder Park was the Halloween event. And so, you know, one of the things we haven't discussed since we've been talking about Frisbee golf is, you guys were putting on Mach 1s back then with lids, right? I mean, that Frisbee doesn't – there's not a lot of space. I mean, I haven't gauged it, but there's not a lot of space between the outskirts of the rim and the pole. I mean, spits had to have been a lot more common back then than they are now. Am I correct in assuming that? Oh, yeah. With the lighter disc, the chains would just push push the disc right out as well. Yeah. It wasn't – more so and in plus the it was center. a larger diameter so yeah. getting inside those chains yeah i think that's one of the things that people don't really give a lot of credit to is you know it it was difficult to get a disc inside the chains first of all and then get it inside the tray wasn't wasn't a small feat either right now in 1983 there when you get your first win are you throwing any bevel did, have any beveled edge discs made it from the coast to the Carolinas by October of that year. Do you remember? Would you count a super puppy in that, Paul? No, that was that was definitely one of the like the flat rim. It's got a flat profile, but it's a smaller diameter and a higher weight. Yeah, but the, that's the only reason I asked. I don't think it was the beveled edge. Like, uh, I definitely put it with super puppies. The orange one behind us there. Is a oh, super nice. puppy. Uh, it's a North Carolina 
uh, disc, super puppy. Uh, no, uh, we didn't see the the uh, beveled edge, you know, eagle uh, as it was first called in, until the, eight, the 83 World Championships in Huntsville that summer. And that must have been, like, was that an electric moment for, for, for you boys on the East Coast, the first time seeing the beveled edge? Oh, yeah. It, it was, it was, it was something else. Uh, I've got a proto that, you know, we soon got, you know, uh, Russell Swartz was uh, in with Innova uh, very early on. Uh, he fell in love with the game and playing with us at Latta Park and UNCC as a graduate. Uh, so we got him early on for sure. Uh, you know, right. we went, I guess, when the 70 mole came out, the Whammo 70 mole, we were putting with those, you know, and the pink ones came out and they would break real easily. But, you know, so that was kind of what we were using. The, you know, the XD, is that a beveled? Yeah. That, yep. okay, yeah. So, so that came about when the XD came out, uh, this maybe the second beveled disc, you know, I immediately started putting with that. Okay. Wow. I still put with them. <laughs> okay, so let's skip ahead a couple of years, and we're going to turn to 1987. This is uh, the year that you turned master. Um, not that you availed yourself of masters right away, but you come up to, to Toronto as well. This is the first time that you come to to Canada, to Toronto. Um, obviously, there's two reasons. One is the Worlds, and the second reason is the Canadian PDGA Championships, which is the couple of days right before. It's a warm-up event. And half the centennial. This is where you tie uh, for tenth out of fifty-five, but you're also tied with. And we're going to ask you stories about David Greenwell and Michael Sullivan. So David Greenwell first. You. This isn't the first time you've met Greenwell. You you become aware of him before that, haven't you? Yeah, we we were competitors. <laughs> we and were what, we were yeah we weren't yeah. enemies. We were competitors. What was your first impression of him? Uh, he, you know, he was a good player. He had a, uh, an awesome and still does a, a thumber roller. I don't have that shot. You know, he could throw any shot that it, that, 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 that it called for. So great. He, he was definitely and still is a great player in person. And now what, what, to, what was it? Was this your first meeting with Mike Sullivan or had you met him before? Probably was my first time being around Michael and okay. as well as Sam Ferens and, you know, the rest is history there. Right. Uh, uh, well, no, maybe not Sam. Sam didn't win there. Hosfeld oh. won there. Uh, I might have probably played with Greg down in Florida at the Triple Crowns before that. But it was an awesome trip. Steve Lambert and I went up. Uh, and and you're as you said, we played the weekend before. Carl was there at Etobicoke. Right. Uh, uh, probably one of two windiest courses I ever played. <laughs> Etobicoke. <laughs> wow. Well, that I think I can remember a lot of wind at that place too. For, for those that don't know, and even for those that do, it's it's right beside the airport. So it obviously wide open, gets a lot of wind. Um, I started playing my disc golf career on the island. And the first time I went to a Tobacco, I almost gave it up because I'm like, what, what the, how do you throw in this stuff? I don't even know. Um, okay, so let's, the, the island. You're staying in dorms in downtown Toronto. You're playing the island. You're, first of all, getting yourself down to the ferry terminal and stepping onto a boat to get over to the place where you need to play the world championships. What's, what, what's your feeling there? This is your first time here in downtown Toronto. You're going to the Island. What are you thinking? Uh, I'm blown away. You know, I'm living in Charlotte, biggest city in North Carolina. It was peanuts, you know, mass transit. So these ferries, uh, you know, international city. You know, it was my first experience in an international city. Right on. 
what you played uh, masters such a good time going across there and dealing with everything first thing in the morning i saw royce posted a photo on royce rusnowski posted a photo on on facebook and i was like that's got to be the ferry to the island and it was you know and i haven't been on it in almost 20 years probably i was like wait a minute that's the ferry to to the island sure enough it was they haven't changed those boats in 60 70 years so the same boats that you rode over to the island, we're riding over every week for, for club. Paint chips and all. Paint chips and all, exactly. So on the island, uh, you play Masters, and this is your first ever Masters event. You decide to flex. There's 33 of them, and you come sixth. Uh, you are two strokes ahead, Jim Palmieri, and your co-inductee in the Hall of Fame, Gary Lewis. Um, Snapper Pearson's the winner of the Masters. Any Snapper stories? Uh, well, not there. I have one when I had the pleasure to go to San Diego and, and we competed, you know, and you see these guys once a year at the Worlds, you know, and, and that's why it was so special. But uh, my wife went to San Diego at a medical board convention, so I tagged along, paid my way, uh, and uh, I went to uh, Alboa Park to play there at Morley Field. And road trans the transit over there, and of course Snapper's there, and and we talk, and I, he didn't know I was coming, and uh, I said, well, I'm going to play, and then I'm going to go to the baseball game. He said, what baseball? He said, oh, today's Thursday. I didn't bring any clothes. <laughs> so, San Diego Padres Thursday afternoon game. So he took me with him to his house on, on the Coronado Island. He got his clothes. We turned around and went back to the stadium. That's a, one of my fun stories for Snapper. <laughs> no, that's just, great. Just a, just a the, great guy. Well, and the stories yeah. don't have to be about golfing. You know, I mean, it's just – it's uh, those – those. I mean, that stuff's just as important as anything because, I mean, you made those – those bonds. And I really think I'm coming to this conclusion more and more all the time that I wonder, I, I just wonder how many other people in their regular life have a great friend like we do in 17 cities across the country or more great friends and more cities. You know what I mean? It's, it's a really, it's a unique situation. Like people don't get it when, like, even when I was in the entertainment business and I'd go show up places and I go, Oh, I got friends here. And they're like, what, from what show? And I'm like, not from a show, from a disc golf event, you know? And, and they would come out and see me and people were like, wow, I didn't really realize it was like that, you know? And to me, that's one of the greatest things about the sport. You know, I got a friend like you in Chapin, South Carolina. I ain't never even been to Chapin, South Carolina, as far as I know, you know, and that's great stuff. Love that stuff. But here's so, my, here, here's my story there after the worlds, I watched Greg, uh, win the playoff against Sullivan, uh, but I was on a time frame. I stuck around. I was going to the Toronto Blue Jays game in the old stadium, right? I said, I'm going. Nobody wanted to go. So, I, I, you know, I'd ask all week. And here it is, Saturday afternoon. The playoff makes it even longer. I get on the bus, get to the stadium. And all I see is just big wall, you know, like I, I'm just trying to find a gate. I finally come up on a gate. I guess I was on the back side of the stadium and, and big gate there. There's a guy there. I said, can you tell me where I go to get a ticket? I'm trying to get in and see the game. He said, well, it's almost over. <laughs> I said, well, that's okay. I said, I, I, I want to get, I've never been here. I wanted to go in and see, you know, see the stadium, see the game. And uh, he kind of looked around. He said, come on in. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> that's good well i swear if you if you say any request with that kind of accent we're we're all going to be suckers for it we'll just come on in but we'll show you the way in so 87 is pretty important also for another reason right mace yeah yeah let's talk about laurel springs man i mean so were you on that first mission on that scouting mission that carl was telling us about yes, let's sir. hear your part of that story man that I've heard so many stories about that place. And one of the, like, as I started to travel, 
were like the last couple of events that were there. And I had, you know, I didn't qualify as an am and, and I certainly never qualified as a pro. So, uh, but talk about, tell us a little bit about Laurel Springs. Cause I mean, everybody's so fond of that. Just an awesome place in the North Carolina mountains, right off the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, one of the places where you just act literally turn off the parkway. That's very rare to go down a private road and up to a Christmas tree farm. Thousands of trees. We were there for 10 years and we watched the whole cycle of trees grow and, and be cut. Uh, Bill Boylan, you know, came to watch the uh, USDGC one year and was inspired to create a course. And I don't know how he got, you know, with who he did, but it was Steve, Carl, myself, uh, went up there to look around. And I think he was already doing some work, design work. And, and we didn't design the course. We just gave him our input. And, uh, we, we actually stayed in a campground right beside the course that that uh, on that trip. Wow. So I I, I heard I've, I've done some reading on this and, and fascinated by the whole story. But Bill basically laid out an 18-hole course with like a super pro or a midnight flyer. Like that was the disc technology he was using. And you guys show up with your fancy beveled edge but what do you have like maybe no not the cobra but maybe a rock an xd this, we're talking 86 early 87 technology here so he must have been just eyes popping and seeing watching you guys throw yeah uh i imagine so i mean if he he was at rock hill there he would have seen the technology that was changing uh so um uh, the, the elevation, you know, was, it made it very interesting. <laughs> so it's iconic, the, the, the photos. And of course, it made it into the, the series of the world's greatest disc golf holes, that hole number one. Uh, you know, when you step up there as a player and you're about to tee off, it's majestic, isn't it? It's just it, not something you've ever really seen before. The way that it was laid out, they have to have uh, paths, we'll call it grass paths, so the tractors can get through to work the, the trees and cut them. Uh, I mean, they trim them, you know, for t six or eight years before they ever cut them down. So they're constantly working. And, uh, and, and on that first hole right by the house, teed off, you can see this hillside. And there was two paths that crossed and the basket was right there in that intersection, which would have been about the size of a, you know, circle one. And, and we're, and we're just launching, throwing as hard as you can, you know, to, to get there. And it's a beautiful start. That's awesome. That's pretty amazing. So in 1987, you took eighth out of 34. Was there, did you do better? Did you have a year that where you finished better than that? Mesa, I don't, I don't really track that. Occasionally I might look back trying to find something, you know, to see for some record, but uh, I, I don't remember. I, I went on and won in, in the uh, master's division. I, nice. You know, the winner's got a nice sterling silver plaque yeah. with okay. your name engraved in your division on it so i i have i know i have at least one of those yeah the one time i stayed with the champ i think he had five or six of them like he had a china cabinet <laughs> with the trophies that mattered and then in the bedroom that i stayed in he had two sliding glass sliding wooden door you know flats slide to one side or slide to the other two full-size closets that were stacked chest deep and pretty much upside down and right side up of the old style marble chunk bowling trophies, like two closets full. He's like, what am I supposed to do with this stuff? You know? And I was like, I don't have a problem like this. 
<laughs> but you know, those, those platters, I took note of that right away. And I was like, and by that time it was 98. So that's, that was already coming to an end. And so I, you know, I missed it all together. It's a tournament a way, tournament way before it's time. Uh, you know, you had Kenny and Florida people, of course, they love coming up to the North Carolina mountains, but you know, we had, uh, you know, people coming from, uh, Pennsylvania, probably, uh, 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 I want to say Joe Mila and, and all those big names up there. You know, it, word spread fast with old technology when good things are happening. Well, I mean, you had the combination of an incredible course, like a par 72, which at that time was inconceivable amongst the, the typical par 55, 54 norms. Plus, you had a very well-run event, which was also high-end. But then the TD slash owner of the course was putting in extra money they were just throwing money at people why wouldn't and you could camp on on the grounds and make a you know full week of it i mean you had californians coming out there you had ontarians coming down for that you, basically it was a form of a mecca for for disc golfers to come and 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 try it out and, and you you were part of that select group that got to go there first to see it and to just to breathe in that magnificent radiance of it all that's first lunar landing yeah so to speak. right uh, I, I didn't miss any of them i went to every one of them that's incredible that's awesome was, yeah but we were lucky charlotte you know two two and a half hour drive so there's so um one of the things i just need to point out again a uh, great resource is there's a documentary, First in Flight, a documentary on the history of North Carolina disc golf. And Dave Hasselberth gave, uh, you know, in, in talking about Laurel Springs, he would say, you know, they'd get up there and they'd be there basically for a week just with the with the course install and, and prep and, and practice. And you know, there's no showers. So after a week, everybody just, they stunk like, like only people can after a week of living in the outdoors, sweating it up. Like a bunch yeah. of dirty hippies. Yeah. Well, I think they were slipping down to the campground showers too. It was like an apple orchard and it was like where everybody was camping. So it's right there beside hole nine, the green of hole eight. Uh, it's, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Wow. Okay, so let's let's skip ahead a year. 1988, you uh, play a bunch of more Masters tournaments. You get your first Masters win, uh, ironically enough, in Kingsport, Tennessee, at the Warriors Lakefront Open. And you squeeze John David by a stroke. Was this, was this a bit of a, an epic battle between you two? Had you guys established contact before this tournament, or was this the first time you met John David? Uh, I, I don't recall, uh, Paul, but no, I'd probably met John much earlier. Uh, uh, well, he was, he was very instrumental, you know, in the Southeast as well, you know, have a lot of courses in the Atlanta area. So we were going to those early on and I don't know the time frame there, but I probably knew John. I, I don't remember the Kingsport event. Well, that was your first Masters event, uh, first Masters win, sorry, not anywhere by near your last Masters win. Um, but one thing I want to ask you in 1988, or sorry, it's actually 1990, is this true, the Earlwood Classic in March 1990 is the first PGA tournament in South Carolina outside of the Myrtle Beach events, which didn't rank the PDJ status, but did they have to wait until 1990 to get a PDJ tournament in South Carolina? Well, uh, outside of maybe Harold's uh, smaller course, when he moved to Rock Hill, he had a small, several smaller courses. Uh, Earlwood was the first target course in the state. Okay. Nice. You know, 18 hole course. Still a great course too today. I mean, that's one of my all time favorite short courses. Not that it's super short, but you can birdie just about everything out there. It's uh, about 30 minutes from here. Okay. Yeah, I enjoy playing there for sure. Ed Garris ran tournaments. First, Harold and Innova uh, ran the events for several years. 
and then Ed Garris, my buddy, uh, took it over, ED the TD, and he, they just had, I think, like their 35th year, 34th wow. year. I, I haven't missed too many of those either. Nice. Very I hot. can see why, for sure. So 1989, you took third at Worlds, finishing behind Snapper as the winner, and then LeVon was right behind you. But you also, this is the year that you won Masters at Laurel Springs. And then there's a big mention of the Triple Crown as well here. So you talked to me about playing the first events at Rockledge before the Triple Crown. What do you remember about that? I think Carl had even played there before to to entice yeah. us to come down, like he said. Uh, it, they were very tight fairways, lots of vegetation. It seems like it was just cut out. I don't want to say through the jungle, but, uh, you know, some of the Excuse Florida me. people could describe it better. But I just remember it being very thick with just – small fairways <laughs> so how often were you guys traveling that type of a distance up you know before that point you know that's a fair i mean that's almost half the half the country top to bottom traveling down to florida how, was that a, was that getting to be more and more common no not at the time the uh the, the triple crown and and I, I went a number of years uh uh, it's an eight hour drive from Charlotte, at least eight hours. And Carl and would come down and uh, uh, as well, several times we met, several times he drove to Charlotte uh, and then we went. But eight plus hours uh, going down was fun. Coming back was not so much fun. <laughs> Especially if you were licking your wounds. Now, this actually is an interesting uh, segue into what we're going to talk about 1990 and the Arizona world, but uh, certainly in 89, you would have become aware of a young gentleman with uh, rather large bug out ears named Kenneth Climo. Did you take note of him at the time in 1989? Well, Carl tells a story of when we met Kenny at the uh, Clearwater course, his home course. Uh, I was there. He refreshed my memory. Greenwell, Dave Hesselberg. We had, we rolled in uh, maybe from the other side of the state from playing two other events, and we get to Clearwater. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Okay. Uh, and uh, and Kenny, I Carl said it was Roger Bunning. I thought it was C. R. Wiley. Uh, I, I won't. I won't dispute Carl's photographic memory, but we get out of the car, and Kenny and his partner there said, "You guys want to play some doubles for money?" As I recall it, and what I do recall was like the rest of us just like looking at each other, like you know, like what is this? You know, like you you want you you asking. You want to know if we want to play for money? <laughs> <laughs> and Carl, Carl told the rest of the story. I, I, I don't even think I played there, but uh, I understand that they they did play. Uh, I guess I played, but it wouldn't have been. You know, it was only like two against the, whoever the other two were. I don't know if it was Carl and Hesselberth or Carl and Dave Greenwell. Carl would know. Yeah. But I just remember the quote, like, you guys want to play doubles for money? You know, it's, it, this is awesome because this, so we've heard this from Greenwell and, that, and we've heard it from Carl and now we've heard it from you too. And that's just, I love to hear these kind of things. And I, you know, if you've ever been to floor, been, been to Cliff Stevens, you got to have an idea of what they're talking about and where they were. And uh, what was it? Uh, I think Dave talked about, oh, he threw that. Was it Dave that talked about him? Kenny throwing that uh, something from Discraft that was super flippy on hole 10 across the water and squib rollered out and worked. But yeah, it's just, it's great to hear that stuff. Without a doubt. Carl, I think Carl, I recall Carl saying that. 
Yeah, you might be right. You might be right. So just in that lead up to 1990 Worlds in Arizona, which was in October, so it was it was a good time for the whole tour season to kind of play out. Uh, over the course of that, there was something in the disc golf world news. Rick Rothstein was running this odds to win the 1990 Worlds. And keep in mind, this is the 90 Worlds. This is the first Worlds that Kleinman will win. And I'm just going to share this with you. Here is the sheet on one of the, one of the uh, this is the summer of 1990, disc golf world news. And this shows you all of the odds to win. And at that, at that time, it's, you know, the historical perspective we have is we look at you know, Clamos. This is the first of his nine in a row, but he's the fourth highest rated odds maker for this to win these worlds. Steve Widecup, who won the Worlds in 89, is clearly the, the odds on favorite. And then John Ahart, who won in 88. Uh, so it's just, it's interesting. When do you remember this? First of all, do you remember reading the disc golf world news and following the, the odds on? Because I don't think they did it in any other worlds. Uh, I do not. I did get the magazine, but I did not. I don't recall seeing that. Okay. I mean, when you look at this, what do they say for Climo, hottest golfer on the tour? Uh, confident and strong. I guess that says it all right there, right? So anyways, I just, I, I wanted any option to bring that back in. Um, do you recall those worlds in Arizona? It was wonderful. Uh, I've got a trophy over there, I believe, from that. Uh, I don't know what place I finished. Uh, I know Tom was there. Snapper was there. Uh, we went to uh, Carl and his wife and my wife actually went along, but she she didn't stay for the whole time. She just came. We, we went early, so she went back, flew back before the event was over. But uh, you know, the swimming pool with water was like bath water. It was still warm and hot. Uh, Harold and I uh, saw all these players with carts: Tom Monroe, Snapper. Uh, had pull carts. They were, uh, most of them were kind of rickety old golf carts, right? But they fixed them up. You know, I, I don't know if I'd ever even seen a disc golf cart, but Harold and I went to a golf store, got a, a cart that was for bags, disc uh, for golf bags, and we made it work. We hung our bag on the cart, and you could, we got a a little thermos thing to put down at the bottom where the where the bag sits because we were thinking like we need lots of water and everybody else has got a cart we need one too and we <laughs> we bought a cart that's awesome nice and, nice. and i've had one ever since oh that's great that's that's incredible that's a great story so by the way you took third and you beat captain snap by a stroke we had Captain Snap on the show a month ago, two months ago. Any fun stories about Captain Snap? Not necessarily from these worlds, but just in general, any impressions that you have you want to share with us? Just an outstanding professional guy. You know, he he's still he's still number one. He's out there, you know, uh, social media, just just a super nice, couldn't ask for a better person to be around and and have as an ambassador for our sport. Yeah, we had a great show with him, for sure. Yeah, he's a good time. He's definitely fun to be around. I'm looking forward to spending some time with him, maybe out there. I want to I wanna get over to the other side of the ocean there and see if I can't get around the golf in with him. Uh, mm -hmm. So, 91, this was your first time not having a podi podium finish in MPM. You finished fourth at World Doubles. Tim, I'm gonna butcher Gibe, G E I B E G E yeah, Gibe, Gibe, okay, out, out of Atlanta. So yeah, you did fourth Worlds doubles, fourth at Worlds in Pro Masters, Red Winnington wins, and you beat Bob Harris by six throws. You got any uh, Red Winnington or Bob Harris stories you want to share? Um. Well, I probably knew Bob a little better 
that I did read, uh, what I remember about that world, uh, was that like, uh, was that in Cincinnati or Dayton? Dayton. Dayton, yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I just remember one course that had a nice pool and a nice recreation center being in the park and rec business. Uh, but I played a lot with Red that week. Uh, and and not only did he not miss a putt, it seemed like every putt was dead center. I guess that's how you can win. But that's what I remember about Red. He was a super nice guy at the times that I knew him. And uh, he had a great worlds there for sure. Uh, Bob, you know, I probably met, you know, in Toronto or maybe in Rochester. And, uh, and Bob, uh, I really enjoyed being with around Bob as well. Yeah, Bob's Bob's a national treasure for sure. Um, we're going to, I just want to skip ahead here real quick to 99. You come back to Toronto. This is 12 years after the world's the first time the world's have left uh, North or the United States. And um, this is my first time running a, a major tournament. And that's where I first meet you. Uh, you are playing in masters and you take um, fourth. The winner is Hosfeld. So this is the second time in Toronto in a row that you've come and Hosfeld's the winner. Is it deja vu all over again for you? Well, maybe for maybe for him, uh, I, I didn't I didn't know the place that I finished. Uh, so uh, just another great great time. Uh, uh, the story on that: Harold and I were supposed to fly up, you know, that weekend, and still were pretty lax, you know, pre nine eleven days. We get to the airport. I do. My wife takes me, and Harold's not there. Uh, he he missed his flight because he didn't have two forms of identification. You got to have something like a, a voter registration card and a driver's license. And uh, thank goodness, I, I don't know how I remembered it. I think Steve did the the time before when we went. Harold missed his flight. So I, I'm on the jet by myself with, you know, a small jet, great flight up, but I'm by myself again. In a big, one of the biggest cities in the world, I'm by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I went and saw the new baseball stadium, but it was like after, it was after dinner or before dinner. And I, you know, you could walk right in through one of those restaurants. So, I did get to see that one, but no game. Okay. Oh, right on. So it, it, it's, it, it's been to a baseball game and a CFL game in that building. That's right. That's right. He has. It's interesting that you that you talk about Harold Duvall. Um, that was the first year of the USDGC and um, the island. The just luck of of being the right place at the right time. The island was one of the. the uh, qualifiers for the United States Disc Golf Championships, and so Harold was actually coming up with the the qualifying stickers. Uh -huh. He gave me those. Uh, thank goodness he made his second flight because I was able to tell who qualified at a glance. Um, you later on that that fall, you go and attend your first USDGC. Is this is this as a as a South Carolina or as North Carolina, but transplanted to South Carolina? To see this come to fruition, this big United States is Golf Championship, the first edition, how does that make you feel? Are you feeling proud? Are you feeling a moment of, of national or state level pride there? When, when I qualified or just the fact that it's as big as it is now? Well, I mean, at the time, did you know, hey, this is going to be a big thing? Well, uh, no, but I thought it was. I, I qualified at Cedar Hills in Raleigh at a tournament there and driving home by myself. You know, I got the little envelope, you know, it, you know there's a qualifier. I'm driving on the interstate. I said, well, let me look at this. So I opened it up. It's dark and, and I'm trying to read it and it, 
And I thought the entry fee said $300. I said, yep, this is going to be a big event. <laughs> but it, it, but it was only a hundred. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I saw it later. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a great event. I, that's, I mean, it's really, it obviously, you know, it's near, near and dear to my heart, but it's, it's really amazing to look at where it was and, you know, what it was that first year. I mean, there was only 69 of us and, and we all, for the awards, we are 68. We all fit inside the shack for the awards. Not everybody stayed, obviously, but I remember Jonathan and Harold and Andy Green standing up on that balcony. And uh, I was sitting over there by the, on the stairs in the back because I slid on that pavement on those golf car, those, those walking trails were made out of asphalt back then. And I came running around trying to get something ready for the ceremony and slid. And I had a huge strawberry on my elbow and on my knee. So I'm sitting in the stair on the stairs in the back with a holding my arm and then holding my knee, trying to get the blood to stop. <laughs> what the awards are going on. <laughs> so, um, I got a bunch of photos that Alan shared with us and let's go to the share the screen and you can tell me, let's tell us a little story about these photos. So this one's real obvious. Oh, wait, I got it on the wrong screen. Sorry, y'all stand by. All right, now I'm up to speed. So this one's super obvious. Obviously, the wall at the disc golf uh, at the IDGC in front of the Hall of Fame wall. Nice. The screen's frozen. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Try stop sharing and resharing. All right. Hmm. Well, obviously, I'm not 13. This is the problem here. We're trying to manipulate technologies and none of us have any IT. How's that working? There you go. There you go. Well, that's interesting. Yes, that that was uh, just before they started cutting down all the trees at the IDGC. I'm about an hour, a little over an hour from there in Chapin. So we went down, uh, Paul Batman, Charles and I, and Tom Matt Garrett. Uh, several others ended up playing together, but that is Steve Lambert's uh, uh, World Hall of Fame plaque. Which, oh, nice. Which the staff there were, it wasn't even on display yet. Oh. Because they've nice. just changed the whole lobby area. Uh, so they had not put them up yet. Uh, and so uh, I don't know if I shared that with Steve. I hope I did, but that's Steve Lambert's uh, plaque. Okay. Wow. That's a beautiful place. Yeah, that's cool. That's good stuff. So, um, well, that's one of the things that's nice about where you live is, man, I mean, such a group of people that you came up with and and so uh, here's another one. Let me get back to it. How about this one? Tell us about that picture. Can you see it? Yeah, that's one of my uh, USC team players. Uh, oh, cool. Graham, Graham White. That was uh, uh, my home course here. Cookie Creek, you can see the older style basket that was put in in 97, but tracking my records, uh, I have to look at it, you know, every now and then to kind of see where I am. So if you're coming up on a big number, you know, like 5,000, uh, that's, that was uh, my 5,000th round of disc nice. golf. So I, I took several photos of, uh, uh, 
John uh, Hughes Courtney was with us as well, uh, but that just had Graham in it. Graham's from Augusta. He's a great grew, grew up playing golf uh, and great disc golfer as well. Nice. I think it's first of all, and hopefully we can touch on this, but the fact that you have been able to teach a class. First of all, the fact that you've been able to teach a class in an academic environment, but second of all, some of your students have gone on to have some great disc golf careers, as it, or at least they great disc golf accomplishments. Didn't um, one of your previous classmates win Female Rookie of the Year? Uh, yes, and uh, Sarah Lamberson Sinclair uh, was on the USC disc golf team and she won the national title that's what uh, it is i want to say like in 2012 but then went on to win the, the player of the year uh, so that's got to make you feel extra special doesn't it yeah sarah was here in columbia for a few years going to school and she she played on was our one female on the team and, and won the title Right on. Here comes another one. Yeah. Um, that one's special. That's uh, Satchel Ford Elementary, an elementary school in uh, Columbia. Uh, that's the high point on the course. Uh, it, you see the, the background. They had enough room there at the school to put in a a nine hole course that I designed and helped put in. Uh, and that's me there with a Braves hat on, you see guys, uh, just posing for that. Um, the PE teacher there runs uh, a five team event. It's coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, a week from Saturday. I'm gonna try to go and help out. That course has been in the ground like three years. Satchel Ford Elementary, you can look it up on uh, UDISC and see more photos. Uh, but uh, they have a, a practice tomorrow with another school there. I'm, I'm trying to go to that as well just to help out. But I don't get over there that often, but it's one of the courses that I designed in Columbia. Nice. You know, it's... Uh, uh... A good piece of trivia would be is if anybody knows how many courses are there are in elementary schools in South Carolina and North Carolina. I mean, it's got to be a huge number. Well, South Carolina for sure. For obvious reasons. That's obviously All one right. of the greatest ways to get the sport going is to get it in with the kids. You know, if they grew up knowing the game and playing the game chances are right Steve well that's, that's one of those i asked harold when harold asked me one time when we were had disc golf tv back in the early 2000s he goes he goes how much are you paying for those commercials and i told him that i was i was working for them i wasn't paying for them and and i said how come aren't you advertising on there and he goes well brian he said would it be more worth my, the worth our while for our business but also for the sport overall if we were to um, install a nine hole course with that $3,000 or pay for advertising with that $3,000. And I was like, he's thinking about things on a whole different level than I am. <laughs> All right. I've got a prediction. This must be when you were a marshal at worlds. Am I right? Nope. Uh, that was uh, the Vermont worlds right after the player meeting. Uh, or before the player meeting there at Smuggler's Notch. Uh, I was just guess meeting Jeff. He was the TD, of course, and I uh, was there as a player. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. Okay. Even better. Yeah, I've heard great things about that place. I haven't been yet. One of these days. One of my One favorite of worlds. Days. Uh, One of these days I'll get that in. All right, this one I like a lot because – this is your happy face for sure. Hold on a second here. You, you're gonna laugh, you guys. This is this is Beeb's happy face, y'all. 
<laughs> That's a game face right there. Come on. Are you That's, kidding me? You better get out the way face right there. <laughs> uh, that, that's a John Winery uh, quality photo. John Winery lives there uh, near Harmon Hills. That was in Harmon Hills. Oh, uh, cool. The Jerry Harmon birthday bash, which uh, is in June, and <clears throat> it, it was not PDJ sanctioned, but uh, uh, I was definitely there. And uh, and of course, in June, it gets pretty hot, even in the Tennessee mountains. So, and I think that was a long jump putt, you know, that was like, you know, get the hell in kind of space. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what that looks like. All right. Okay. Here's a good one, too. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and make another prediction. I bet this one was with Carl, but I could be wrong. No, that's uh, that's my neighbor. Uh, he, he takes me fishing. Uh, I live uh, in Lake Murray. It's a uh, uh, one of the biggest lakes in the state, and we're just showing a striper there. Carl right. Carl fishes in old fashioned, you know, little boat with a little small motor. He moved up from canoes to a small to the job motor. It. But, but that's, I've been to the cabin. Yeah, that's a nice place for sure. But uh, we just troll around in the nice pontoon. That's my way of fishing. There you go. Nice. Nothing wrong with that either. Nothing wrong with that at all. Let's see. I think I got, oh, yeah, I got two more. Here's this one is from the man Cation, if I'm not mistaken. No? Oh, I don't know. That one? Uh, no, that's probably more recent with that uh, Yeti cup there. So that would have been that would have been post mancation, but uh, you know, uh it was always a great time. The, the triple crown I said was the most fun I've ever I ever had playing, you know, when we went to those. But uh this was probably with some of my friends around here. Uh David Floyd, uh, but the that's my two or three or four times a year golf round. Wow. Well, you look like to the manner born. You look like you're ready to just step up there and knock it stiff. That's for sure. Yeah. All right, tell us the story on this one. I imagine this is your team page photo, is it not? Which one? Yeah. The Alberti, yeah, Al Beaver. They put one, that. Two. That was one of my, you know, uh, I've been with Innova from day one, and they've been good to me and and uh, Harold and the Innova family and Dave and Tim, who I used to see just once a year at the Worlds. There, uh, I know which which one it is, uh, but. I am a team end of a player. Well, so did... you can clearly see you're using the Bonapain grip in this photo. Uh, so when did, that when, when did your association with, did you start with Innova right at the beginning or when did it begin? When did, when did you start first throwing the Innova discs? Oh, well, uh, as soon as they came out, I, I officially met Harold uh, before he moved to, to South Carolina at the 85 Tulsa Worlds, where he had just won the, his second title. So Russell Swartz, Steve Lambert and I are there, uh, Tim and Dave, they were late waiting on the award ceremony, late. And, and so I, I met Harold uh, briefly there and in 86 he was back in Charlotte for that Worlds and uh, that's when he uh, met his future wife and, and shortly after moved to Rock Hill that, that's that's a I mean when when Harold met Carolina is, is one of the most important factors of this golf story, history 
to 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 begin with the fact that you knew harold before that was was great and and shows you that the groundwork was already the state was ready to to welcome him as a as a native son right from the start yeah so we're gonna we've already taken your time for a long time already we can't thank you enough for taking all this time and, and giving us your attention I just want to, to ask you a couple of things about um, South Carolina itself. You've been serving as the PDJ state, state coordinator for South Carolina. We've already talked about this, you being um, an educator there. How long have you taught courses at the University of South Carolina? Well, uh, again, I retired, but this was every time I come up here, I think about when I was preparing for my flying disc sports classes, I took it very seriously. Uh, I had great students. You know, I didn't know, uh, I, I, I'm not an educator uh, other than from the park and recreation, you know, coaching side maybe, but uh, I was there from like 2012 to uh, 2019, something like that. Nice. Uh, it was it was very rewarding for me, you know, the students, you know, I didn't know, you know, they were, they were, there was a PE class, you know, one, one credit, you know, one of those like, yeah, let me take something for fun. But, you know, they were punctual a long time, you know, we had, you know, we only had an hour and a half each class. So, you know, I had to keep things moving and, and I, I, I see some every now and then, and uh, I'd love to see some of the students. I do have some of my former students and team players that, like you said earlier, are still playing disc golf. So that's very rewarding as well. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Another another opportunity to play Johnny Appleseed. Yeah, definitely. I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you one of my Andy Frankenhaus stories. Oh yes, okay. Uh, boys. Uh, Triple Crown, probably the last one I went to, uh, because I I flew down. You know, it started getting after so many years. You know, it was better to fly. We flew to uh, Orlando from Charlotte, easy peasy. Brent Hamrick picks me up at the airport. You know, in a convertible in February. You know, like of course. snow snowing where he is. So. You know, things like that just made it so special. And Greenwell was always there. But it's, we go, we finish in Clearwater. It's time, you know, it's over. I got to go to the air, Clearwater Airport, fly back to Charlotte. So Andy's going to take me, okay? I needed a ride. And Andy, you know, things were still probably going on, but I have to go. There's one bridge over uh, the Tampa Bay from Clearwater to get back over to Tampa. So, you know, I'm probably cutting it close as you normally do. We're going over the Tampa Bay Bridge, traffic stopped, you know? I mean, dead stop. nobody's going over. So we sat there a little while, and he's, you know, he, he gets out of the car, he says, let me go up here and see what's going on. And I'm thinking like, that would be okay, but I don't think it's gonna help any. He's gone like five minutes because he walks way up there. We, I, I don't even know what's going on. You know, accident, obviously. Uh, he comes back and just a couple minutes later, traffic is going. <laughs> he said he talked to him. He said, you know, there was no reason why one of the lanes that wasn't blocked couldn't be open, he said. And damn, they didn't let, let the traffic start going again. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Got me to the airport on time. There you go. And he didn't even have to break any laws to do it. I love it. Uh, hey, so is, let me ask you, let me ask you uh, about the term rookie move. Is that me? Bra is that one of mine? It rookie came move? from Brad Tucker. He said it's one of yours. Yeah. 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 He talked about getting sleeping in the back of a pickup truck at a camp out and you told him that was a rookie move. Yeah. Because he got rained on. 
like everybody else had a tent. Yeah. They got rained on too, but Brad was sleeping in the back of his truck. Yeah. Uh, it's all in fun usually when I say things like that. Uh, yeah. I've well, I bet the, Brad's still laughing about it today. I, I've, I've heard the term. Uh, I just I just said that to somebody recently, uh, and I can't remember what it was what what it was right off off the bat, but I I try to be careful what I say, but you know I'm I'm almost seventy two now, so you know you can kind of say what you want to. I don't <laughs> think you got to be careful anymore, Beef. <laughs> you can uh, hey, you're in the Hall of Fame. You can absolutely say what you want to say anytime you want to say it for sure. Well, I, I just want to tell you, like, we're before we cut this off, we've seen a lot of people tonight that we haven't seen much. Uh, Dave Nesbitt, Aaron Dimpton, John Haggerton, Robert Leonard. Robert Leonard mentioned that when he invited you to his wedding, that you asked him what event was going on that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Charlotte Amateur Championship. And you said, well, that'll be a pro-only wedding. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good one um and howard tuned in jeff davis greg brooks dan cashin kent johnson hal kurz keith mation uh steve johnson he had a couple of good good things to say about you obviously um uh, then let's see who else kevin mccoy jb rapapold rap rapapold uh David French, Dennis Janney, oh goodness, Otto Spires, Chris Hinckley, Brad Bishop, Tucker Bradley, David Mansfield, Dennis Inager, and Ted Barber, Peggy Berry, Mark Jacobson. Man, you brought a lot of people out tonight, Beef. Michael Speaker, Ryan Bivalacqua, uh, Daniel Marcus, Brad Smith, Tim Oates, Snap. Captain Snap showed up. Nice. So yeah, that's a that's a good diverse group. I like to read it off, you know, because well, it just shows a few people are paying attention. Yeah. Yeah. We 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 can sit here and talk for hours with you, my friend. Of course, we don't have all the hours to spare, but um, in lieu of, we can't thank you enough for taking this time and uh, all of your attention, and energy to, to to give us wonderful stories this has just been an incredible good times hour with alan beaver for sure well it's been a lot of fun guys i appreciate all you do and thanks for having me on thank you yeah sir. for sure and thanks for joining us without a doubt and uh, looking forward to seeing you if not sooner certainly in october Definitely. i'm close to rock hill so if you get down this way just let me know i got the end of a bed and breakfast down here Ah, there nice. you go. <laughs> the end of the nice. Day. I love it. Yeah, yeah right I might have to up later in the summer for a round at uh at Earlwood, maybe. Nice. Yep. No problem. In the meantime, Alan, you take care of yourself. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Guys, great seeing you. Great to Keep see you. Keep in touch. Right All right, buddy. See you soon. Have a good evening. Good night. Thanks everybody for tuning in. <laughs>